Welcome to The Road. This is a weekly podcast of All Saints Lutheran Church. I'm your host, John Pedersen, and I serve as pastor. Each week, we reflect on faith, life, and navigating the road ahead. The language of journey is common when we think about life. It has its joys and challenges along the way, and we all need a little encouragement and guidance at times to keep us going. There's a word in the Bible, asphalia, which means truth, but it's the same root word we use in English for asphalt, if you can believe that is a solid surface that makes travel easier and more assured. And so every week we're going to be exploring elements of faith and life that keep us on the road. Faith isn't about living a perfect life. It's about finding our way, getting through rough spots, but seeking out those great vistas too. You can find my weekly message here, but you'll also find special conversations with guests who have insights on things like wellness, parenting, and living with unique purpose. If you appreciate this podcast, remember to subscribe where possible and share it with a friend. Here's this week's message. We're continuing our series, Real Jesus, exploring the real person that we encounter in the Bible. It can be easy to form assumptions about who Jesus is and conform him to our preconceptions and preferences. And some of those false ideas of what Jesus and faith represent can even become harmful. So, We're going back to a series of important but challenging stories this fall and discovering what's really at the heart of Jesus and our faith and how that's still relevant for us today. Story I just read uh, from Mark 10 is about a man who approaches Jesus and asks him a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a question that I think many have asked in one form or another across the ages, what do I need to do to be right with God now and in the life to come? And we'll get to more of the details of their exchange. There's a lot that could be said, but what we learn is that the rich man seems to view faith as a kind of transactional relationship. Tell me the standard I need to meet. Tell me the steps I need to complete. What do I need to do to check the box? And this man is approaching the question of salvation as a bit of a transaction of some kind rather than a relationship and a journey. And in response, Jesus seems to set an unbearably high bar. First, he says, you know the commandments, and he lists several of them that relate to the neighbor. And the man states that he has kept all of the commandments since his youth. You know, you have to kind of wonder, is the man being just maybe a little bit arrogant or overconfident here? I've kept all of them since my youth, but Jesus doesn't challenge him on this. He takes him at his word. And then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing, go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But as we heard, the man, instead of following, walks away from Jesus, shocked and in grief because he had many possessions. And even his disciples are perplexed. It seems incredibly difficult. But Jesus points to their own willingness to leave things behind, their willingness to sacrifice, their willingness to commit themselves to the journey. In many ways, this is a lesson on the first commandment about loving God with your whole heart, which is at the heart of of the first table of the commandments. And when, interestingly, Jesus listed off commandments to this man earlier, they were all of the commandments related to the neighbor, kind of typically considered the second table of the commandments. And those are important. But Jesus is now talking about the added importance of a relationship with God. And again, Jesus lifts up what seems to be a very high standard. And for those who are approaching faith as more of a kind of transaction, I think many might have an understandable reaction to this. They want to say, you know, I'm not too interested in that service plan, Jesus. Uh, Do you have a Christian light package for me today? (laughs) That's more of what I'm looking for. But what Jesus is calling him and his disciples into is a lifelong relationship and journey that will change everything. So it prompts a question for us, what is it that you want out of life? The man wanted to know what he had to do to inherit eternal life. What is it you want? 
And I think it would be really easy to hear this challenge from Jesus and say, you know, that kind of life seems like more than what I'm looking for. I think we often view religious commitments as a unique kind of thing, and some people opt not to follow a religious path because it seems, you know, at times maybe unnecessarily rigorous, so they opt for just kind of living life their way. But for the moment, let's put aside the idea that a drastic action like that has anything to do with a religious life specifically. And let's just talk about life for a moment, shall we? Several years ago, I preached a message on the movie Arrival, science fiction movie about the arrival of aliens, all right? (laughs) It's less action, more cerebral. In that message, I talked about some themes in the movie that dealt with the nature of language and communication. Uh, It's not a religious movie at all, but it has some themes that resonate a bit with maybe morality or spirituality. But I bring the movie up for another reason today, and unfortunately, it's going to be kind of a spoiler for you uh, if you haven't seen it. I'll save some of the details in case you want to watch it. But it's eight years old now, so if you haven't watched it, too bad. (laughs) The main character is played by Amy Adams, and what you learn over the course of the movie is that she becomes able to see into the future. And she comes to realize that she will experience tragedy and loss if she begins down a path. But embedded in that loss is also great joy and a relationship that is deeply meaningful to her. She can avoid this tragic loss of someone dear to her if she walks away, but in doing so, she would lose the relationship and that life altogether. It's a profound and complicated ethical decision, but also a very personal one. And in the end, she chooses to accept all of it. The joy and the pain. The profound loss along with the profound love and meaning. Her life, like ours, is not as much of a cafeteria as we think, where we get to pick and choose a little of our favorite of this and a little of that. Bible and faith aside, life is a journey and it's filled with risk and we don't gain wisdom and insight without struggle. We don't experience the fullness of life without all of it. C.S. Lewis, the famous author, spoke and wrote about this after his own loss of his wife, Joy Gresham. The pain now is part of the happiness then, he wrote. Trials, sacrifices, difficulties are often interwoven with so much of the joy and happiness that we experience as well. You can't pull it apart. The life of Jesus exemplifies that in his own story of life, death, and resurrection. Again, the rich man in many ways is approaching faith and eternal life like it's a calculation or investment. He's showing a desire to make an effective and appropriate investment in eternal life as he identifies it. But eternal life isn't a hedge fund. It's not an index fund. A life of faith isn't something you can easily calculate in a way that makes sense. To live is to risk. Helen Keller was born in Alabama in 1880. She inspired generations as a woman who lost her sight and hearing when she was 19 months old. She once said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Security does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than exposure. It's not so much that the life of faith or eternal life comes at such a high price, but that it requires us to risk much to become vulnerable. And so to my earlier point, a challenging life isn't unique to a religious way of life. It's something we find about life in general, and Jesus is pointing that out to the man who wants to know what it takes to inherit eternal life. Faced with seeing into the future and what it will involve, he walks away. And yet Jesus says 
if we're not willing to do so, we can't fully live. And unfortunately for the man, possessions are not the sum of life. They aren't the ultimate point. And if you hold on to them too tightly, you can't embrace the fullness of life that God has to give us. You're not able to share the abundance of life that God promises. To experience life, we have to throw ourselves into it on some level. There are so many ways that people have read this passage about the rich man and have tried to make sense of it, to try to manage it. And among the many explanations and minimizations of it are to say, well, this isn't really true for us. It was just something Jesus sensed this particular man needed to hear. You don't have to really give a lot up. As long as you make some small efforts to be a little bit generous, that's fine. And some might say the response Jesus gives to the man just shows us how difficult it is to live up to God's perfect law and how much we need God's grace. It's just an object lesson to show us we need God's grace. We don't actually have to change anything in the end. Dietrich Bonhoeffer read passages like this and he asked, aren't we supposed to take them seriously in some way? and not immediately come up with some out clause for ourselves? <laughs> Isn't there some truth for us to hear in this lesson from this teacher? Wasn't Jesus actually trying to teach us something? He wrote about his own experience of life. I discovered later, and I'm still discovering right up to this moment, that it is only by living completely in this world that one learns to have faith. One must abandon completely any attempt to make something of oneself. By this worldliness, I mean living unreservedly in life's duties, problems, successes, and failures, experiences, and perplexities. In doing so, we throw ourselves completely into the arms of God, taking seriously not our own sufferings, but those of God in the world. Perhaps we're called to follow and take some risks. Is God's grace still available to us if we fail to follow like the rich man? Many other stories and words of Jesus would suggest yes. Jesus himself says in this story that nothing is impossible for God. But are we missing something if we just walk away? Do we miss something about the meaning of life if we continue to focus on our own possessions as the answer and solution to all of life's questions? I think so. Jesus spoke about money and possessions quite a lot, not because they are somehow inherently bad, but because he saw the way they can distract us from what's most important and because hoarding them can cause harm to others and create unjust inequalities. Until we challenge ourselves to let go of our grasp of it, we can't actually embrace the life that God offers. The man, after all, asked what he had to do to inherit eternal life. Another way of saying this is, what do I need to do to get the full experience, God? And Jesus tells him, but it requires way more than he could have conceived of. Money doesn't provide us with a sense of eternal meaning, but it does help us provide for our human needs and the needs of our neighbors. You know, back in 2019, an article in the Wall Street Journal reported that the three wealthiest individuals in the U.S. own more wealth than 50% of Americans. In other words, three people have more wealth than 160 million Americans combined. And the top 5% of Americans own 70% of the total wealth in the U.S. I mean, is that God's design and intent? We live in a time in which many people across the spectrum feel like our society isn't working. And for many of us who are doing okay, we may not be able to relate to that, but we know that a healthy society can ensure everyone has access to basic needs and opportunities. As Mark says in verse 21, God loved the man, just as God loves us, and just as God loves every one of our neighbors. God wants everyone to experience the fullness of life, starting with having access to the basics. 
To understand that lesson is to grow in our experience of life. Jesus says the disciples who have followed him will receive life in this age and the life to come. Eternal life in Jesus begins now and continues forever. We can share that life in word and deed today. Following Jesus isn't just a nice, interesting idea. It's a call to life transformation. It's a call to participate in the redemption of the world and not the world just as some idea, but actually redeeming and restoring the life of our real neighbors. Jesus invites you and me to follow today, to become vulnerable, to be willing to let go of what we cling to so dearly and to embrace the life and the world God is offering. Each of us is called to respond, but we can also do it together. We don't have to be alone. We don't have to go it alone. Come and follow. Amen. That's this week's message. You don't have to navigate the road ahead alone. You can join with others at All Saints. Visit allsaintsmtka.org for more information. Have a great week.